No, don't go, James. <laughs> Good morning, Pat. This is a crisis-ridden morning in all sorts of ways, not least I, by handling of the technology. Uh, uh, there are three things we're going to talk about really quickly. Apple, yeah. we want to give the southern government 13 billion plus euros and the southern government who don't want to take 13 billion euros from Apple. Uh, and the case was heard in the European court, I think, and uh, the, the judgment that came down was, no, they don't have to pay it. But I think that's going no. to be an appeal, maybe. I'm not sure. Um, what are your thoughts on yeah, the idea yeah, of a, a state it's... that doesn't want to take 13 billion uh, uh, we're in the middle of a, a COVID crisis that's causing massive economic problems. We, we're uh, facing Brexit coming down the line. We have all sorts of problems and so on. And our government doesn't want 13.2. They want to help that poor little company, uh, Apple, who are only worth uh, something like uh, uh, 1.3 trillion. It's for, now, poor little Ireland, you know, helping out poor little Apple. Uh, you know, one, one of the, we deserve each other, and, and, and uh, you know, it's great to see pe poor people helping each other. Why do you think the southern government is prepared to do put itself in such a ludicrous situation where it's begging a big company not to give it 13 billion plus? Dude, Why I are they think it sounds, sounds like the act of a madman. Absolutely, we I, I think we've spent someone like I'm open to correction, there's someone like 10 million on legal fees, helping, uh, 10 million. Uh, you know, that could build a wee school somewhere in Donegal, but anyway, it's, uh, we've spent 10 million or something that help, helping Apple fight the case not to pay us and all the rest. Now, here, I talked to a great capitalist, uh, well-known businessman not that long ago, and he said to me, it's very important for our credibility on the big business and the corporate world that when we make a deal, that we stick to the deal and that Ireland's been seen to play its part. No, that's great. But my argument is this. Uh, I'm quite literally from where I'm sitting now. There's a little corner shop, uh, you know, a little general store. And that, they pay uh, everything that they can, you know, they're paying their 12.5%. They're paying whatever other taxes do. Their employees are on 25% PAE. PAE. They're also getting hit with uh, the universal social charge and all the rest. There was a Dutch MEP on, uh, I think on Wednesday, following the ruling, and he said, I pay more tax as an individual than uh, Apple pay as a corporation. Now, when you're in a city, by the way, Jude, let's get this on the record here. Apple have three, as far as I know, or had three stateless corporations working in Ireland. In other words, they didn't pay tax anywhere in the world because they were stateless. Mm -hmm. And this is a corporation that's worth $1.3 trillion. They're, they make up, I think, near enough 2% of the world's corporate wealth. No one company, and but on Ireland, where's the equity? Where's the fairness? Where's the morality? You know that the ordinary people are and the ordinary uh, businesses are paying uh, their all their fair share of tax, but Apple aren't. And there's another way, side. Not, Pat, there's another side. Like that is, Apple brings jobs. You know, big companies like Apple bring jobs to Ireland. And that's what makes for yeah. prosperity in a, in a state. You Dude, where, to where, the, where, where are they going to go? Yes. They need English speakers. They need well-educated uh, workforce. Ireland has one of the youngest populations in Europe. It's English speaking. Uh, the Americans and the, particularly the, the Apples and the Microsofts, they need entry into Europe. Ireland, Britain's no longer in Europe. They need Ireland. They, they, if they go to Spain or Italy, they're into all their language problems. They're into a different... Plus the fact, even a stupid yeah. thing, the, the climate in Ireland is actually very conducive for big com computer yeah. companies. I, I think that point, all right. But, Pat, a lot, a lot of uh, people on the continent, I'm very struck by how good their English is. You know? I, Imagine Jude, they could... Uh, 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 yeah, Jude, but that, that's... that's that, uh, okay, Jude, but that's 5%. You know, you, you know, you can do a, a cafe and the waiters can speak English, brilliant. But if you go down the street, how many uh, uh, Pedro's or how many, um, uh, what's, it, what's it stereotypical German name here, whatever, can speak English. Now, okay, there's certain points, but everybody in Ireland can speak English. Uh, good point. Uh, I suppose it's this question of international, big international, multi-million, multi-billion uh, dollar companies uh, really calling the shots throughout the world, actually, not just Ireland. In other words, they're more powerful than the states in which they base themselves. And that's a yeah. scary thing. That's not democracy, really, is it? 
Yeah, well, Rupert Murdoch and people have got to prove that. Mur Murdoch has zero uh, loyalty to Australia or Britain or America. He's changed his address or and his status two, two or three times, wherever the money is. And there's, you know, a lot of these executives, uh, they go into a country and love for several years. They have no loyalty towards it. They're, they're, they're globalists in the sense that they don't care where they live as long as they probably have a couple of security guards on their gates. Dude, this is not a victimless crime or a victimless... These guys, like the guys, the CEOs of Apple and Microsoft are billionaires. They, their chief executives are paid uh, literally millions per year and all the rest of and you go down the street and there's people here now struggling because of COVID and all the rest. There has to be something, morality and fairness and equity for any society. You know, what's happening, you know, we, we had the old feudal society and we used to have revolution. Yeah. You can nearly see, they're going to get the sides down from there, the pikes down from the thatch very shortly. The way I, things think, are going. I, th I think that idea of controlling them, though, will only work if all countries sort of buy into it. In other words, all yeah. countries commit themselves to making sure and saying we will not allow Apple or whoever it may be to be in our country if they don't pay the reasonable charge and taxes that we levy. Um, yeah. Only if it's everywhere, because if it's just Ireland, they'll find a way. They'll find a way. They go somewhere else, and they'll find a way. If it's Australia or yeah, or, yeah that's no, actually a very good somewhere. point you make, Jude, because they they are global companies, but they're not global laws to cover them. They really are more powerful than the than the. Um, the people, Nation states, the definitely. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I just thought about this since you mentioned uh, Murdoch. Um, see the, uh, all these Irish Daily Star, uh, Irish Daily Mirror, Irish Sunday Times. That seems to be an example of the same kind of thing, actually, colonialism uh, in the media. And meanwhile, small local based newspapers are going to the wall. Um, would you feel indignant? I feel indignant about that. I really do think that the government should do something about that and not allow these companies to just come in and suck up readers, you know? Absolutely. Well, you know, you know they, they have got a sort of a main frame and then they have wee spurs off it or yeah. a main line. And like, they, they, so in other words, they can cut the costs. You know, if I try to set up a printing press, employ journalists, uh, advertising staff, get an office here, it simply wouldn't be feasible. But um, they've got a main frame and they can have a wee spur. I, I can send uh, down a line and I can get everything printed and I can have an uh, office sending out advertising uh, accounts and all the rest of it. It's easy for them. So they're just, they're actually, they're like a sort of a magnet. They're just taking in everything that's out there yeah. and the, the, the wee local companies are falling apart. Well, you see, again, I would compare that to, to Apple in a sense because it's the same thing. They're supplying jobs. Uh, but they are a company that's, you know, big and powerful and they're damaging the local product. Like your little businessman at the corner has to pay his taxes and Apple gets away scot-free. Likewise, yeah. there are small uh, newspapers, provincial newspapers going to the wall and uh, uh, things owned by, newspapers owned by Murdoch or other, other moguls, um, they're, they're, they're just uh, taking up the Irish Absolutely. And, 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 but, uh, but we don't have a media policy, so go ahead. Jude. Yeah, yeah, well, it's a fault in two things, I think. The, uh, on the one hand, these big foreign direct investment, and secondly, in terms of the media, which is terribly important, I think. You know, I don't think they, yeah. well, they do appreciate the importance it has, but uh, they shouldn't let them off. Okay, second point, uh, second area, Michal Martin's visit to the north, and Michal Martin's woes in the south. Uh, yeah. His woes come directly from Barry Cowan, who, as you yeah. know, was up uh, on, um, well, he had, he was caught over the limit four years ago. Um, he said he was barely over the limit and he fessed up and he said he was terrible, sorry, and so on. And then the Garda report emerged and apparently it says that he did a U-turn and tried to escape and Cowan denies this but he has lost his job. Should he have lost, he have lost his job? Uh, yeah, well, Jude, right. Uh, uh, put it in context, right. See, uh, when it started off originally, I thought, wait a minute, this is not a hanging offence. Uh, apparently on the day of the All-Ireland, he had two pints. He went to the All-Ireland final, had something to eat, met a few friends, drove home. On the way home, he was stopped by a Garda, at a Garda checkpoint. Yeah. Apparently he was not on that, he was slightly over the limit and they have some discretion. And he would not have been disqualified for that. But 
what happened was that they discovered he was driving on a provisional license. So they, they charged him with that and he was disqualified on the basis that he shouldn't have been driving. Uh, uh, and the two things combined, Jude, what the legality of it, I'm not 100% certain. Mm. That, that, uh, that, uh, had that ended there, it would have been sort of fair enough. But then suddenly he discovered, wait a minute, here's a guy 53 years of age, a government minister who's been driving for 20 years on a provisional license. Why didn't he regularize and become a full license? And under the Irish law, you're supposed to have a qualified driver of two years standing with you if you're driving on a, a provisional license. had a guy with him, didn't he? Didn't he no, had to admit that on many occasions he didn't because well, it's easily proved that he didn't write. Hmm. Secondly, uh, uh, they then turned around and said, uh, at the checkpoint, now this is a guy, and he just puts it and he's taking legal action. But yeah. the, Sunday Times, I think it said, that when he came to the checkpoint, he did a U-turn and sped off, and the guardie had to follow him. He is disputing that, and he says it's an error and all the rest, but the guardie of... Uh, but anyway, all this is going on, and it's drip feed, drip feed, drip feed. And when it, uh, uh, Michal Martin got the file link on Tuesday at 7 o'clock in the morning, and he said when he read it, he said to Barry, Mr. Cullen, you've got to get to the doll and explain this away, because there, you know, it's starting to become an issue. And he refused on legal advice, and he said he wasn't going to do that. So Michael Martin at two o'clock was supporting him and he told uh, Barry a pardon to go away and reflect on what he should do. And Barry then came back and told him he wasn't going to get into the doll. So uh, Michael Martin sacked him. Now, under those circumstances, I think Michael Martin had very little choice. Well, he's made, a, he made another enemy, I'll tell you, because... Um, oh, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a queue of them. Absolute <laughs> queue. Uh, you know, Jim O'Callaghan, uh, who uh, was their justice spokesman and very, very good, he... He, he, he must have been sitting going, there's a girl called, I think it's Norma Foley, she's the Minister for Education, nearly the first day in the Doyle type thing. Right. And she's promoted to a minister. Yeah. Dara Kaliri, Kaliri, his deputy leader, was uh, given... He's got a job, right? got a, I, a, I, by, job. By, oh, by default. So, yeah. and uh, Michal Martin, you know, Michal Martin uh, didn't handle it very well. So there's How a about, lot of enemies out there. How about the way he handled things in the North? He came up and he met uh, Michelle and Arlene. And uh, with regard to the North, he said he wanted to establish good relations, uh, uh, a shared Ireland, as he called it. And he said there was going to be real work put into that. He didn't actually tell us what the work was that they were going to do, but there's going to be a lot of big, heavy work done on, uh, you know, helping to develop a shared Ireland. I thought we had a shared Ireland at the moment, but he says there'll be no border poll in the next five years. Uh, uh, Jude, you know, I've, I'm not a big, uh, what do you call it, Republican, but when I uh, listen to uh, Michal Martin calling himself uh, the leader of Fianna Fáil, the Republican Party, I'm sort of falling off my chair laughing. The Republican Party, Michal Martin has run away from the whole concept of unity, of discussing the United Ireland, like you wouldn't believe. He's faster uh, 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 than Usain Bolt when it comes to uh, discu uh, making discussions on this. Right, first things first. Uh, he says there's going to be no barter pool, right? COVID has changed. It proved we need one Ireland. We need one Ireland strategy. Brexit proved the attitude of um, uh, the DUP during the Brexit negotiations. I, I, Jude, I think you were at the um, uh, Waterfront Hall when, what, about 1,500, 2,000? I always call them the shirt and tie nationalists. You know, the SDLP types, you know, uh, uh, showed up. It doesn't mean you're a bad person was, if you wear a tie. No, no, no. But what I mean was, this is your school teachers. This was not your tattooed boys from the back corners. And this is stereotyping at its worst. But this was your middle class, nice Catholics and nationals showing up saying, we have had enough of this. So, and the demographics, 50, near enough now, 50% of the, the population in the North. All that is changing. And Michal Martin, uh, rather, rather than uh, uh, wanting to discuss all that, wants to run away from. Yesterday, Steve Aiken, I was watching the uh, uh, BBC News last night, the leader of the Unionist Party. I heard him swooning over Michal Martin saying, this is a guy we can do business with and, the, and I want a reset of the relationship we had with the last Taoiseach, not, not uh, um, uh, Leo, Varad uh, Leo Varadkar, the man who spends all his life attacking Sinn Féin, was too green for the, uh, for the Ulster Unionists, but Michal Martin isn't. So I, I used to, when, years ago when I used to hear a British Prime Minister congratulating John Bruton on being a great Irishman, and you, I used to go, what has he sold us out on now? Well, Michal <laughs> Martin, to me, is becoming like that. You know, in other words, Michal Martin is not a friend of nationalism. 
So you don't think maybe you don't think may have a sincere when he says that he's going to put some really hard work into a uh, serious work into developing this notion of a shared Ireland. You're saying you don't believe he's going to do that. Please take us in the spirit in which it's intended. Absolute bollocks. He has <laughs> no intention whatsoever. It's, it's, you know what? It's uh, kicking a can down the road. You know, we'll, we'll have a talking shop. We'll produce a report. We'll put it up on the shelf. It'll gather dust and nothing will happen. You know, he seems to forget that, uh, Jude, that the, the demographics are actually changing. You know, let me repeat for the 15th, 20th time. Four out of the six counties are now nationalists. Belfast has changed. The, 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 what is the, uh, the guy? It's by 20, the next year, by 2021, the, the, the unionists will be an, a minority in, in demographic terms. You know, somebody should start addressing those issues. But Michal Martin, there'll be no uh, border poll or no real uh, about this in my lifetime. Or he has the right to call it. He, it's not his call, is it? It's uh, the call of the British Secretary of State. Michael Barton surely doesn't have the right to say yes or no. No, but uh, come on, Judah, if, if the Irish government is whispering in the ear of the sec don't call this. The, no Secretary of State with the, in his right or her right mind is going to go against the Irish government on the thing about Irish unity. Now, Dominic Cummings said, uh, apparently, he said, I don't give a whatever if Northern Ireland falls into the sea. Uh, you know, so I think the unionists should seriously have a look at what's actually going on around them at the minute, but that's a matter for them. I'm not their advisor or whatever. Yeah. Well, but, uh, that, but just, uh, there's just one last thing that I don't know if you saw that little uh, video of um, oh, what's the guy the the uh, Green campaign George Mombio uh, 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 a little four minute video he did and he set it up set it up on Twitter and it was about the history of British imperialism and he showed this a badge that was awarded to people and it was. The badge was of Britannia, the figure of Britannia, with her foot on the neck of a black man. Yeah. And he said, that essentially, you know, that's, that's the British Empire. He said, all the things that we were taught about British imperialism over the centuries was a lie. And that's yeah. an Englishman. And he then told in that yeah. four-minute clip, little clips within his clip of the Kenyans being rounded up, concentration camps for these people, talking about how they were castrated, how they were shot, how it just really was a horror show. And I, yeah. all I can say is I salute George Bombio, where you have an Englishman who's prepared to face the truth about the British Empire and say they screwed everybody they possibly could, they didn't care what they did, and people had to take it or leave it. And yet we were presented with that as a civilizing influence throughout the world. The white man's burden. It, what is it? Churchill was uh, named Britain of the century. This yeah. is the man directly responsible for four million starving, four million Indians to death. And looking at the famine here, uh, the lazy, fair at, uh, attitude of the British government. Hey, uh, imperialism was not a force for good. Right. Okay, we'll leave it there. Okay, Pat. We, uh, we on the other uh, hand, are <laughs> absolutely. <laughs>